Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this Kendall Hunt webinar, Differentiate for Success. How do you create and teach strategies to distinguish students, early and experienced careerists, and even yourself for profound career success? That is the question we are going to answer today. But before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping points. This webinar is being recorded. You'll receive access to that in the coming days, as well as our presenter's contact information so that you can reach out to them as well. We will be taking questions today. We'll have a dedicated Q&A time at the end, but please feel free to enter any questions that you have in either the chat function or the Q&A function. Now to introduce our speakers, we have Dorothy Billingsley, who was so gracious to be with us today. She's a certified professional coach and CEO of Billingsley Associates, LLC. She has served at the partner level in three top 10 retained executive search firms, including the world's largest. She founded Billingsley Associates in 1998 in New York City, later expanded to Chicago, Dallas, Los Angeles, and then Stanford, Connecticut. And with all offices now consolidated in Florida, she enjoys concentrating her efforts on more personalized client services. She's got more than 25 years of successful experience conducting senior level retained executive searches for board members, chairs, C-suite executives, partners, and their management teams. And by invitation of her clients, she has expanded her services to include culture shaping, leadership development, executive team coaching, and alignment. She is an author, speaker, and workshop presenter on career and search development. Dave Harris is with us as well. He is also a certified professional coach, and he is the owner of Dog Star Prep LLC, a college and career readiness firm based in Las Cruces, New Mexico. His mission is showing students how to build outstanding professional networks and acquire the skills and knowledge necessary to be an effective leader in the 21st century. He has over 30 years of experience in higher education, having served as college president, business dean, MBA director at the University of Utah, and an award-winning business faculty member. He taught the freshman career level success strategies course for over 20 years. He also lived in Japan for over 16 years and served as an executive at Itochu Corporation and Murata, two leading Japanese conglomerates. He's got his Doctor of Jurisprudence and a Master of Management from Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our two highly esteemed presenters. Thank you so much for joining us today. Can't wait to hear your presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. And welcome, thank everyone. Thank you for carving out time in your busy schedules. And a, a special thank you to Kendall Hunt for sponsoring this webinar. Um, it's, it's our privilege uh, to share with you various strategies to distinguish, differentiate, and above all, demonstrate success. Uh, working with Dave Harris over the years has been absolutely phenomenal. And we decided to focus, because it is a really very, relatively very large uh, subject matter expertise, to focus on best practices for networking and also market talents and marketplace talents and skills. So before I hand the baton over to Dave, I wanted to, uh, it's always, always best to illustrate, illustrate with living demonstration success. So I would like to, uh, to feature Dave, uh, someone that I met over, well, a long time ago, many, many years ago. Uh, and he was the youngest, by 15, 20 years, a uh, candidate that was selected for a high level corporate role. Uh, so already uh, differentiating amongst not only his peers, but many 10, 15 years his senior. Uh, that allowed us to work together, watched him uh, soar to even higher uh, uh, realms within corporate America, uh, international uh, um, executive role. And then one day I received a call from Dave saying he was teaching at a major state university. And I said, wow, <laughs> uh, how wonderful before I knew it. He was the dean, then the president, and moving all around the country to uh, various uh, very dignified um, 
uh, universities and just contributing to so many students' lives. Um, he invited me to uh, visit the campus and work with students. It was a highlight of, of, of our years. We just loved doing that at least once a year. Uh, put together workshops and just uh, very invigorated by the uh, career development and career building with students. Uh, he then said back in 2017, Dorothy, I want to teach, uh, I want to teach your course um, in August. This was February. And so not knowing what I didn't know, I said yes. And the book was available in the bookstore <laughs> in August. Uh, I do believe a lot of divine intervention was there. And so Dave and I have had the privilege of, of teaching uh, Chart Your Course over many years to hundreds and thousands of, of students. And uh, so with that uh, demonstration of success, I'd like to uh, uh, hand it over to Dave as our story together continues. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That is so kind. And Megan, I would like to thank you as well for arranging this. It's um, great to be with you. And so, Dorothy, right back at you here. Um, I, I, it's my privilege um, to have partnered with you for the over 30 years now. Can you believe how time flies? It's amazing, isn't it? And, and I'm just going to share this story right off the bat. You know, teaching a career strategies course to entering freshmen, um, you know, I was looking for a textbook. And couldn't find one that really talked about differentiating in the marketplace. In other words, how are students going to get a competitive advantage in the marketplace? And, you know, so I said to Dorothy and Joel, you know, her husband, is there any way, you know, you, you've been thinking about writing a book. Is there any way you can write one? So they graciously wrote Chart Your Course. And I've used this book in every class I've taught. Um, in career strategies because it's that good. And students have really gained um, from that over the years, Dorothy. So I wanna thank you and Joel for making that happen because it really means a lot. So I want to start the conversation um, with acknowledging your excellence and Joel's excellence in this area. So Dorothy, feel free to jump in um, as I start my comments. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk for the next 10 minutes or so um, about um, the marketplace um, for students right now and also how we can really help students excel um, because that's what Dorothy and I are all about. And so before I do that, you know, I was reading an article last week um, from the Wall Street Journal and it was really eye-opening for me, um, to be honest. Um, the, the, the finding of this particular journal and research was 54% folks, 54%, that's the majority of Americans feel that a four-year degree is not worth the cost. That's to me, that's alarming, right? And so the reason I'm mentioning this is because colleges and universities in this day and age really need to think about how to differentiate themselves in the marketplaces, not only students, okay? And one way to do that, in my opinion, um, from my experience in higher education in the corporate sector, is to really have a world-class, one-of-a-kind career strategies program that teaches students how to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. I think that's absolutely critical. And I know that many of you in the audience are from educational institutions. Um, and what I wanna do is share the following. You know, if you can um, have a um, branding or marketing piece that says we are the only community college or college to do this, okay? You're way ahead of the game. And what I just like share is, that fill in the blank um, with a differentiation program. I think it's really important. Okay, so let me share um, what I've done in the past um, um, and how I've taught the career strategies um, course to really help students gain a competitive edge in the marketplace. So as a business dean, I scheduled the career strategies course as the first class for entering freshmen. So when they arrived on campus, okay, at eight o'clock in the morning, Okay, they went to the career strategies course. Okay, and I taught that course um, because I really have a passion for teaching. And on the very first day, I asked two questions, okay, of the students. The first one is, what is four million? Okay. And the best answer I got is my net worth after you know going to college. <laughs> but that wasn't the answer I was looking for. The second question is, what is 250 slash five slash one? Okay. So let me talk about these two questions. Four million represents the number of graduating students from US colleges and universities annually, 
4 million, okay? The second question, what is 250 slash five slash one? 250 represents the number of applicants for a position that a student desires, okay? Five represents the number of people interviewing for the position, okay? And one is the person selected for the opportunity. And Dorothy always reminds me, it's Dave, it's really 510, you know, more than that. And so the point of the story is this. I ask my students, have you positioned yourself, okay, to go from the 250 to the five to become the one, okay? So how are you going to really stand out from the competition, okay, to get the career opportunity you want to have? Okay, so that's the question, okay? So now I ask this question in my consulting firm to every client, okay? Because I want them to start thinking about how to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, okay? Having that differentiation mentality is really, really important. And today, Dorothy and I are gonna focus on two areas. She mentioned this earlier, okay? The first one is how to build outstanding professional networks. As we all know, who you know in this marketplace is absolutely critical, right? Okay, so that's the first part of this conversation today. The second part is how to acquire the leadership skills and knowledge employers seek, all right? What you know is equally important, okay? And these two things are really, strategies are really important as you move up in organizations as well. I know Dorothy's gonna cover that. Okay, so recently I had a, the privilege of working with a client um, who, who is an entering student at Claremont McKenna College. It's a highly selective college, outstanding college in California. And what I wanna do now is I want to share part of the conversation I had with him on building and maintaining an outstanding professional network, okay? So what I do is I cover how to build and maintain a professional network with faculty, staff, alumni, career services, and community leaders, okay? And so I build a what I call a differentiation plan, which is really a um, work plan to help students really stand out in the marketplace, okay? And so regarding the interaction with faculty, all right, I didn't see many colleges and universities really teach students how to interact with faculty. So I thought of that as a you know, great opportunity. And what I do is I talk about the steps to engage with faculty with my clients. So let me share that with you. It's really a strategic roadmap for students to interact with faculty, okay? And so the step one is I tell all my clients, make sure that you have a professional business card even before you arrive on campus. Okay, so as an entering freshman, my client has an incredible um, professional business card, better than mine, actually. Okay, and what that does is people can scan it, put it in their database, and he can build up his network, right? And so step two is to really dress professionally, okay, and really have a positive attitude. Dorothy talks about this in her book, okay, and really introduce yourself in a professional manner when you go to the faculty's office. Okay, because as we all know, first impressions are really, really important. So what my clients will do when they approach faculty, the first comment that they'll make or the request that they'll make is the following. I would sincerely appreciate it if you would kindly provide me with some advice on how I can maximize learning in your class. Now for the faculty on this Zoom, okay, wouldn't you be impressed if you had a student who was an entering freshman come into your office and ask that question first? It would certainly impress me. And then the obvious, you know, the faculty member is there to help. When somebody takes the initiative to ask a question like that, okay, they're gonna stand out from the crowd. That's just reality, okay? And so step number four, in okay, case to build that relationship. You know, Dorothy is very good at talking about this, building the relationship. I work with my clients to list strategic questions that they're gonna ask the faculty in follow-up meetings, okay? For example, joint research opportunities, strategies and conversations that 99% of students do not ask faculty, okay? They'll come into faculty offices and talk about my grade, 
okay? They'll come into faculty offices and talk about what they missed in class, okay? My clients don't do that, okay? They talk about strategic questions, okay, to really stand out in the marketplace. And then step five is to continue building that relationship with the faculty and then get assistance, okay? Because people love helping students. Get assistance on informational interviews. You know, get a mentor as a faculty member, okay? Last step is what I call MCSP, multiple classes from the same professor, okay? When I was at the University of Washington, I took six classes from Dr. Crutchfield, okay? Learned a tremendous amount, got great letters of recommendation, great mentor, okay? Once again, a strategy to stand out, okay? Very, very important. So in other words, you know, it's really important for, uh, important for us as educators to really, really stress the importance of thinking strategically to differentiate yourself for success, okay? So Dorothy, I can go on and on about this topic, you know that, okay? But I'm gonna stop it here and turn it over to you um, to discuss um, the networking strategies. And I think you're on mute. My goodness, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Dave. That was outstanding. And, and one note I'd like to make in speaking to Dave's classes, and many of them very large, two, 300, um, as we speak uh, around the, the country, um, Dave's classes, there were lines of people coming to thank us and to ask us questions and to give us their business cards. Um, so it's just interesting when you offer to um, network with people at the end of a speaking engagement, many times there's a line of maybe 10 <laughs> at Dave's question at Dave's uh, classes, they uh, are they're very, very long and sometimes and we have two lines. So um, these things definitely do distinguish and allow you to receive information. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, best practices uh, in, in networking. I'm gonna focus a little bit on, more on that early careerist and the seasoned executive of which many students are of all ages these days. So it, it does cover quite a bit. Especially about networking, it's interesting. I, I really do think that as we teach networking to students, we're ahead of the game. And especially, I mean, those that are working with Dave early on in their career, um, exposed to uh, a commitment of teaching networking um, within, within the, an educational system, sometimes starting as early as high school. They're very much to uh, an advantage because many early careerists and, and senior careerists think that they're not good at networking. They have an old fashioned view and frame of reference of what networking is. They think that it's in that big uh, cocktail uh, hour at an association where they're speaking to people they don't know. That's one teeny tiny little bit of what networking actually is. So having a new frame of reference, whether a student or a senior careerist is really necessary. If you hear anyone say, oh, I'm not good at networking or I don't like networking, it's a wonderful opportunity to challenge them. And again, work with them to change their frame of reference that networking really is about giving and receiving. Uh, as, as Dave mentioned, those students that come in with those strategic questions, uh, they're, they're, you're, they're, you're building relationships with them. Uh, you're learning from them. Uh, we all learn from the students just as much or sometimes even more. Um, so the whole giving and receiving aspect of, of networking, it's not only about asking. It's not only about getting the courage up to ask because everyone really does want to assist you. All you need to do is ask. And that's what we teach the students as well as the senior executives. Um, oh, there might be someone that's having a little bit of a not great day, but uh, uh, overall, everyone really does want to, to help you. All you need to do is ask. And many people are very interested in paying it forward because someone has done that for them. So the, the frame of reference um, that this is really a gift that keeps on giving, um, the earlier they can start to have that experience with it, the more confidence uh, and the more momentum can be built. 
Um, so it, I can't tell you how many senior executives I meet that lose their jobs after 20, 30 years and they don't have a network. They, they never thought this would happen to them. They might now today have a LinkedIn network, but that's not as specific. Um, there's usually an abundance of people that are not VIPs. So, uh, you know, whether a student and or senior executive really teaching how to develop that VIP network um, and not just in your phone, <laughs> but an organized approach, either on an Excel spreadsheet or a, a, a database. So creating, creating, getting it down the VIPs and then expanding. So it, expanding. Everyone that you know, everyone that your students know, and this is VIPs of family, uh, friends, uh, prior colleagues, um, internal, internal colleagues as well, um, mentors. So it's all of the above that everyone that you know can provide you three to six contacts. Um, they know you, they know their contacts, so they can match you up via maybe industry, interest, or just a gut feeling. So everyone that you know can provide you three to six names of someone. You're never making a cold contact. And so thus the network grows exponentially and can be utilized for, um, especially if it's an internal network. Uh, to your company for promotion, external, it can be used for professional association, um, a variety of things and or a job search or just a, a holiday uh, a, a gift to stay in touch. And then these wonderful ways that you have no idea. When, when I first met Dave, and yes, it is over 30 years ago, <laughs> I had no idea this would blossom into such a multi- uh, faceted uh, relationship and the lives that we have touched has just been enormous and, and, a, and a, just a, a gift. Uh, so, so creating the network, uh, the uh, commitment to a mentor uh, or a coach, um, you know, many people have professional coaches today that are uh, provided by their organization and, and many spend their own well-earned dollars on a relationship with a coach. Uh, a mentor is just amazing. Many, many companies today are starting to revisit it. It's kind of an art that was somewhat a little bit uh, not as promoted as other uh, things. So, so I call it infinite intelligence is shared. You know, a little more focus has lately been on the artificial intelligence. So mentoring um, is such a, a very low cost aspect, having senior students mentor, junior students, alumni mentoring, and of course, those dear mentors that we have throughout our lives. So uh, professional associations are not just something you can join it to become a, a part of a, a leadership team, whether it's just a facilitator to build your way up to have students, the leadership opportunities on on campus to learn that as a as a freshman um, and, and continuing into their professional career. People say they're good leaders. Well, that sounds good, but we like demonstrations. Again, living demonstrations and being the vice president, president of an on-campus association and or a professional association. It opens up opportunities for speaking, uh, webinars, podcasts, co-writing articles. Uh, just uh, you could write a book through something such as that as well. So uh, this increased visibility these days really matters. And it's not all only done just through social media. There are just a tremendous, it's a big thing. It's a very big uh, in all respect, but there are just a variety of, of manners in which to increase the visibility. Uh, volunteering, so many um, executives have met coincidentally, certain people that have influenced their careers and lives through volunteer activities. Um, I'd like to make a lovely plug for Toastmasters. This is very much for students as well as MBA students and early careerists and really everyone can, you know, this, the material is amazing. And for those that think that they're not good networkers, uh, they get an opportunity to network. Many corporations have Toastmasters within. I'd like to use Brad as one of the examples. He didn't think he was a good networker. I think he's one of the best networkers I've ever met in my life now. And that transformed very quickly. He's with a large major bank um, in, in Minnesota. They have uh, two Toastmaster groups, I think. 
the network contacts that he met through Toastmasters, uh, you know, accelerated his career tremendously. And so, um, as, as Dave talked about, the exploratory interviews, um, there are, you know, over 80% of positions that are not even advertised or maybe even created that are specifically created, created for people through exploratory conversations and, and interviews. So, um, yes, we, and, and oh, and I, well, I'll just make a one little plug here for executive recruiters. Just remember the best time uh, to develop relationships with executive recruiters is before you need them. So, and you can help them out. Uh, we, we, we value good referrals and these types of relationships. So, um, so Dave, would you like to uh, continue with the best practices for the marketplace talents and skills and knowledge and that anything sounds, else to offer about the networking? Yeah, that sounds great, Dorothy. So I just wanna add one comment uh, because you bring up great points on networking. You know, I always tell my clients um, entering freshmen, always think one step ahead. And what I mean by that is I want them to really establish friendships and professional networks with sophomores, juniors, and seniors who've gone through it, right? And so freshmen have a tendency to hang out with other freshmen. Okay, my clients don't do that. They're going to be joining student organization and leadership positions to meet the sophomores, juniors, um, seniors, and also network with MBA and other graduate students, okay? They've gone through the process. And so, so I think that's a really um, important point. And I just really appreciate the point that you made about networking with student organizations. It's absolutely critical. So let's talk, Dorothy. Let's make the transition and talk about the how to acquire the leadership skills and knowledge employers seek, because obviously it's extremely important. And I'm going to start my conversation now by saying that with every single client, I really stress the importance of liberal arts education. I'm a former business dean, and I'm talking about the importance of liberal arts, okay? Because it is absolutely critical um, for a successful future. And Dorothy, do you wanna jump in on this point? Because I know that you have strong feelings about this as well before I go on with my comments. Oh, please continue. Okay, okay, all right. And so, so if you ask employers, and Dorothy and I have done this, we have many, many connections with with um, executives and hiring managers and others. Um, if you ask an employer, what is the most critical skill you are looking for in team members, okay? Communication skills is always gonna be at the top or close to the top of the list, okay? So for me, it's really important um, to educate my clients on the importance of communication skills and have a differentiation plan to address this area, okay? I think it's absolutely critical. All right, and this applies to all majors, all levels of professionals, whether they're entering students, okay, mid-career professionals or senior executives. Okay, this is a really important area. So I have a laser focus on four different areas in communication. The first one is intercultural communication. Okay, the second one is interpersonal communication. The third one is writing skills. Okay, and the fourth one is presentation skills all critical in my opinion, all right? And so let me talk about all four of these briefly. The first one, as far as the intercultural communication skills, okay? I'm gonna use one of my former students at the University of Utah. His name was Brad, okay? And Brad just is a tremendous student, tremendous person. And I take a group of students, and Dorothy knows this, I take a group of students every year to Tokyo, Japan, okay? I spent 16 years there. I worked for two Japanese conglomerates. And so for the past 22 years, I've been going to Japan, okay? And Brad accompanied me on one of the trips. And basically, he understood right away the importance of understanding a different culture, the importance of really getting familiar and becoming fluent in a foreign language, okay? My Japanese abilities have really helped me out in my career. And the importance of working with a diverse group of people, Okay, and diverse professionals. Diversity is absolutely critical in this day and age, right? And so he, Brad received a phone call um, from a company while we were at the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And um, he, he informed the company, yes, I'm at the Tokyo Stock Exchange. I'm learning about Tokyo stocks. I'm learning how to deal um, you know, with international stocks. And he received an internship on the spot okay, from this company because that was one of the differentiators they were looking for. OK, 
Okay. And so I wanted to share that story to really emphasize the importance of learning languages and culture, once again, the liberal arts education. Okay. For interpersonal skills, um, Dorothy mentioned this earlier, um, having um, no substitute for experience, right, Dorothy? So having, you know, working with student organizations, working with people, working in different internships, um, really does build up your communication skills, okay? And also wanted to share that I really emphasize to my clients the importance of establishing relationships and professional relationships with English professors and communication professors, okay? They're going to help you gain the knowledge you need to be successful in life and also in your career. Great opportunity for resume building, great opportunity for distinguishing yourself through references. So I really emphasize that point. I also emphasize what I call alternative credentialing. And many of you on this Zoom know what I'm talking about. Digital badges in this area, okay? Taking the initiative, shows initiative, okay, when you earn a digital badge, okay? Learning outside the classroom is absolutely critical, okay? Then I also really inform my um, clients in the differentiation plan, independent studies, folks, really important helps with your writing projects, help you present papers at conferences. Dorothy mentioned this earlier, absolutely critical. Once again, we're going from the 250 to the five to the one, to become the one, become the person obtaining that great career opportunity, okay? And then I also discuss in the communication area in all areas, like it. the client I had recently is a finance major, okay? So really thinking strategically about course selection. For those of you teaching the introductory career strategies class, if you can really talk about course selection strategy, it's going to really help students. My students will be taking classes from executives and residents. My clients will be taking classes from endowed chairs. My clients will be taking classes from adjunct professors like Dorothy with incredible experience that they can share, okay? Great mentorships are formed. Great lifetime connections are formed. Okay, once again, separating yourself from the competition in the strategies that you implement is absolutely critical, okay? And so, you know, I talk a lot about differentiation plans. It's basic, basically a work plan to help students distinguish themselves in a certain area, okay? And so I mentioned a few, but really, if they, if a student shares with me their career interests, I'm going to put a differentiation plan together on the areas that are absolutely critical for success. Okay. And that's where the experience comes in, you know, networking with people like Dorothy, executives, hiring managers to make sure that I am current in the area. Okay. Of differentiation and career strategies. Okay. And so, so Dorothy, I can go on and on, obviously, um, but I'm going to turn it back over to you to talk about skills and knowledge. Yes, and, and again, with a, with somewhat of a focus on the early careerist, uh, as well as a senior careerist, yet really this, this is just for all of us. Are we not all students? <laughs> Still, I am. Uh, and Dave, thank you so much for that. That was awesome. And I do have, you know, being a considerate communicator on, on, on my list as well. And I am going to go ahead and start with that because when I first started teaching as an adjunct instructor, I was absolutely amazed at the uh, room for opportunity and growth uh, with verbal, but especially written communication. And I must say, it's not just for students. It's 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 mid to early, uh, and also including senior uh, uh, executives as well. So, and it's it's all communication. So it's interesting, some of the best students that um, as we do our discovery process on, on uh, what, uh, what you want to do and, and the, your purpose, uh, the foundation, your purpose, um, there's a question. And many of the students will answer it that they do not think that they are a good communicator. Whereas they are an excellent listener, they're a wonderful listener, and they're very good at writing. And so I say, really, if you want to learn about communication, tell me about your listening skills. And they really are empowered to learn that they're much better communicators than they ever, ever thought. It's not all about what verbally comes out. 
Um, so that active listening, being an active listener, uh, and, and really working on taking uh, advantage of all the resources that are, well, okay, all the resources that are, are available, especially on campus. Uh, but, you know, and now we have the chat GPT. I mean, it's kind of interesting what's happening there as far as really teaching us all to be really good uh, communicators. So, uh, but it, it, again, it includes that what I like to refer to as quality content brevity. We want to see that on resumes. We want that in interviews. Dave, Dave is a master at it. Okay, I am not yet. I'm. We all have our opportunities for growth, and I'm still working on all that quality content brevity. Um, it is. It is a gift. So, uh, you know, uh, ditto on all of the efforts for communication and really for all of us as well. Um, one differentiating factor I'd like to bring up, and this goes for students all the way up to senior executives, is uh, the ability to manage and, and, and deal with resistance. So if we look at everything that we do has a form, uh, has, a, has an initiative that we take. Everything that we, we start, whether it's a, a class, uh, whether it's a, a degree, it's an initiative that we take. And every initiative, now many, many don't take the initiative. They just think about it. They just say they want to do it. So there is a step for those that actually take the initiative. And always for every single initiative, there's resistance. It's natural, it's normal. It actually grows up, although it can be inconvenient and uncomfortable. So uh, I like to liken it to a seed that's planted in the, in the earth. And as it grows up through the, the, you can still water it, you can add sunshine, uh, but if it does not grow up through the resistance of the, of the soil, including earthworms, which are very valuable, <laughs> uh, the form, the stem does not pop out of the ground. And thus then the, uh, the results, which the form could be the degree and the result, an amazing job in contributing to so many people's lives. So I watch um, the most amazing students, early careerists to senior careerists, either go around resistance, go under resistance, go above resistance, or kind of sometimes like a bullfighter, when the bull's coming right, charging right at you, you step aside from the resistance, uh, but rather than just trying to go through the resistance and banging their head, et cetera, or other you know, things that we pretty much all have found out that don't work. So they know how to embrace the resistance uh, and, uh, not, not in, in various ways. Uh, many times they have mentors that teach them how to, whether it's family or professional. So managing that resistance is key. They do not play the blame game. All right. Instead, they ask, what can I do? Uh, and, and another uh, real distinguishing factor that, that I do see from uh, talents and skills, that, I mean, these are the people that get promoted. These are the people that get job offers when they're not even looking. Um, we call it the fundamental four. So there's, their talents and skills are exceptional. That's their hard skills, their soft skills, their transferable skills. They're all the very best that they can be and or they're getting additional certifications or becoming even 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 better or learning more or shadowing others. Um, so that's their talents, talents and skills. Um, the second fundamental four is the mood is the uh, embracing everything with an upbeat mood now. Does that mean that sometimes they don't need to mountain climb a little bit to, to get to that mood? Well, they learn that tool too. So they have a toolbox as to how to have that distinguishing mood in every class, in every, in, in every situation, um, client facing or customer facing, um, and, then, uh, and, and then service. So we've got talents and skills, mood and service. Okay, so this is not only service to customers, service to clients, uh, service to family, service um, to, 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 um, to professional groups, uh, volunteer. This is also service to themselves. So they learn a self-care plan. They learn how to take good care of themselves. So kind of just like the analogy on the airplane, they always ask us to put our oxygen mask on us first before small children or older adults. 
So um, the third, the fourth then is consistency. So consistency in all three, talents and skills, mood and service. I mean, how many of us would continue to go back to a restaurant that the food just wasn't any good, even if the service was nice and the mood was up? Uh, probably not for too much longer, or you know, or you know, as we look at major corporations that provide good, good, good products, a good mood, and and good service. So this consistency builds trust, and that's what happens with those executives, those students that are that are um, uh, promoted into different leadership opportunities by their by their colleagues, by professors, to those that are promoted within corporations. And again, those that, you know, they're they're never really, they never lose their job. If they lose their job, they're just available because there's so many people that do want to hire them when they receive the, the news. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, one other thing is the whole balancing artist of all this, but I still do think that old saying of if you want something done, give it to a busy person. And I do see that consistently as, uh, you know, people that balance family, volunteer, a major, major uh, corporate role. Uh, they're the ones that get things done or know how to work with others to to get them done. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's an overview. I mean, Dave, you've been in corporate just as me and uh, um but again, I, I think everything that we're talking about really applies to that exceptional student that as a freshman, no one told her that she could uh, seek a, a, uh, an internship. And so she did. Maybe she didn't get it the freshman year, but she got two the sophomore year. So these are these exceptional um, individuals that, uh, again, you know, maintain amazing skills, uh, keep the mood up provide exceptional service and consistency in all three. And, and that those of us that work with them, we do our very best to demonstrate that as well um, as, a, as a teaching tool. Dorothy, may I just add two quick comments? Because um, I, I think they're relevant. So, so my mentor at the University of Washington told me something that I'll never forget. And it goes to your point earlier. He said, make sure that you're comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that advice has really helped me throughout the years because you're absolutely right. You know, everybody's gonna have uncomfortable situations, okay? Um, and that's okay, okay, because that's life, right? So that that comment by my mentor really helped. And then the second thing regarding resumes, um, you know, people have questions about resumes, we can talk about this in more detail, but with resumes, the I tell my clients all the time, the ultimate goal of a resume is not to need one. <laughs> I have, I have uh, my closest friend who went to law school with me, okay, is so good at what he does as an international tax attorney. He doesn't have a resume. And so, and so just a different frame of mind as far as resumes. <laughs> um, and so I know that you're the expert at resumes, but should we open it up for a Q&A at this point, Dorothy? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Dave, there'd be so, I love what you just said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because being free to experience discomfort can make it go away too. That's the interesting thing. Um, but absolutely. There'd be so many people that work on resumes that would love. So this is kind of a whole new angle that I think a lot of people <laughs> would love, you know, <laughs> to not need to put together a resume. It's kind of an arduous process. And I must say, I honestly, since MBA school, I did not have a resume until after Chart Your Course was written. I figured it'd probably be a good idea to have a living demonstration of having my own, uh, updating my resume. So, oh my, and this is being, <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. I, I see Megan on the screen now. So Megan, I'm, we're going to turn it over to you for Q&A if that's all right. Sounds good. And before we jump into that, um, I think we'd really be remiss not to bring up chart your course one more time. So if you are, if you're on today and you're listening to this and you're like, wow, this all sounds great, but it seems like there's never time to incorporate, you know, as many things as you want into your course, um, even though the best intentions are there. Um, chart your course is just a fantastic um, already put together a resource that you could use in like a first year seminar or any kind of careers course. And I'm sure there's other applications that um, Dorothy, you could speak to if I'm, if I'm missing things, but um, 
it's it's fantastic. And so um, that's a great thing to look at. We'll give you guys an opportunity after the webinar to um, request a free copy of that if you so choose to give it a look through. But um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and jump into some Q&As. Uh, we were talking about interviewing a little bit earlier. We've got someone who says, I have some really, really amazing students. Uh, they really stand out of the crowd, but it seems like whenever they go to try and, and mock interview or something like that, their personality flips. They kind of turn into exactly the opposite. So what are some tips for helping those students who really shine to shine in the same way in an interview setting? Hmm. <clears throat> Oh, wonderful. Well, Dave, do you mind if I take that first? <laughs> I'm going to rely on your expertise, please. <laughs> <laughs> please chime on in. We have a fun exercise that actually works with students uh, very, very well and and in all levels of, of executives, uh, students especially, um, and it works wonderful via, via video. So uh, it's a role playing exercise and, and each student uh, for 10 minutes plays the role of the um, interviewee and then 10 minutes as the interviewer and 10 minutes as the observer and they, and they switch, okay, they switch. There's a checklist that the observer fills out and it's recorded and everyone learns from this. Now, as the, as the instructor, of course, I would even have more things to offer than just the, uh, just the um, interview, just the observer. But what happens is they see themselves in this confident interviewer role. When they're interviewing, they, they're interviewing one of their peers. They are so confident. And then when the tables turn and they're on the other side of the table and they're the interviewer, interviewee, they turn into a completely different person. They're, they're nervous, they're not as confident. Um, and it happens with just this uh, 10 minute uh, opportunity. If you can have more, it works even better. And the observer of course gets to have the advantage of observing both. So it is a, a phenomenal exercise. Now, what I see happen within just two interviews, the first interview, uh, to the second interview, uh, recorded interview, the interviewer transforms. They see this, they pick it up. Interview skills can be learned. I mean, nobody interviews all the time. I mean, that would be kind of a big question mark if someone was a professional interviewee, <laughs> changing jobs every so often. So there's a natural nervousness a little bit to it. But this exercise just really, really hurts and we it helps and we it might hurt a little bit at first when they see the first one, but then they get to make this progress uh, to the second one. The, the checklist is in Chart Your Course and, and you can even add your own, uh, or over time I add certain things as well. So it's, 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 very, it's very effective. And, and the key is practice. The key is practice, not just in those recordings. The, the key is practice. You can record yourself. You can work with a mentor. And I know Dave has such great expertise with his students in, in practicing interviewing, especially because he's such a great speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. So, so just to add to what Dorothy said, you know, when I um, taught the career strategies course um, to entering freshmen, I had a lot of alums come in and talk about their failures during an interview. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that is because I want students to see these highly successful CEOs, CFOs, OK, talk about the challenges they had because they're human beings. All right. That really helped my students. OK, because then they went up to them and talked about it and then they did mock interviews with them. And so so strategy number one is to, you know, maybe consider that for your course. Strategy number two is I had a list of expertise who are tremendous people, great interpersonal skills expert interviewers, okay? I interviewed with Dorothy. It was the most grueling experience I had. <laughs> but it was probably one of the best experiences I had because it really made me think strategically about future interviewing. And I agree with Dorothy. Practice makes in continuous improvement, right? And so having somebody like Dorothy come to class, Okay, she was gracious enough to come to class for the last 20 plus years. <laughs> but that really helped my students as well. So there are many resources out there, people who truly care about helping students 
interview because I was one of those students in college, okay? I had a hard time interviewing, I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? So practice really does make perfect and the connections, and this is why networking is so important, especially for faculty members who teach a career strategy course. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dave, you, you did phenomenal. And the good news is, you know, I never noticed that you were nervous. So that, and that happens too, kind of the duck analogy, you know, swimming, you can't see all that's going on below the, the duck as he's swimming. So looking calm on top. So, so Megan, Dorothy must have not seen my twitching underneath the table, <laughs> <laughs> my sweating. Uh, <laughs> well, and, you know, remember really interviewing is all about just being yourself. So it's removing the obstacles of the ner a little na naturalness to being nervous. That uh, Almost everybody when they're on that side, even including myself when I'm on the other side of the table, I'm usually interviewing people but when I am being interviewed you know there's a naturalness to that so uh breathing there's some there's tools and techniques to work with so when we say practice we don't mean putting together commercials we mean learning about the toolbox and using the toolbox and letting go and truly being yourself excellent Really, really wonderful. We have a, a very nice comment here by Brandon. It says, great to see you and hear your voices, Dorothy and Dave. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, expertise, and overall fabulousness with us today, onward and upward. Thanks, Brandon. That's very kind. Um, yeah, one you, more Brandon. question thank here. <laughs> one more question here. And then if anyone else has any, um, I want to make sure we address those. So feel free to enter those in the chat or Q&A functions now um, or whenever it's convenient. Um, but we do have another question. Both my colleagues and myself are uncomfortable with interviewing. Um, kind of like you guys were talking about, it's not something that we regular doing, especially if we have a position. So do you have some do's and don'ts or um, other practice techniques for uh, helping our students with something that we ourselves are kind of uncomfortable with? And I think you guys spoke to this a little bit, but any other do's and don'ts would be appreciated. Right, right. Well, it, you know, it, it is interesting that uh, interviewing, it, you know, being, being an interviewer is not always taught. Um, and so thus either the the being the interviewee. Um, so teaching uh, interviewing, if you're uncomfortable with it yourself, can really feel kind of, of, of awkward uh, a bit. Um, career centers are amazing, but they do support just such a tremendous amount of students. So, uh, I think, so, you know, sometimes as we are teaching, uh, we're learning just as much. I must say, I have in, I have interviewed thousands and thousands of executives and students over the years. I am a constant learner myself uh, from, uh, you know, Jen, who got her fantastic eyeglasses it, that gave her confidence for a wonderful job that she still has and does amazing things with. So there, there's just things here and there that you always pick up and that you learn. So so as the instructor or the professor that is teaching, interviewing, um, I think that's what, you know, it, it's really good to have these practice sessions and we all, everyone learns together because interviewing is just something that I, I don't think it ever becomes uh, comfortable. And like Dave said, <laughs> uh, there are some things that uh, um, naturally in life that are just uncomfortable. But the great thing about the interview is the more you get going, then you're in the moment because that's what it's all about. Active listening, being in the moment, listening, asking, answering the question. And you kind of get in a, in a zone or in a flow. And it's a, you hear remarkable things uh, sometimes come out of your mouth that are that are outstanding. So uh, the the practice is a little bit more about just being um, a, a little more comfortable with the process, um, actively listening and answering the questions and being free to say, can you repeat the question? Uh, being free to add a little humor by saying, you know, I haven't interviewed for 10 years or this is my first interview. <laughs> uh, uh, so sometimes a little humor can also uh, be added in. Um, but that, you know, there's, asking good questions. It's a whole art of asking good questions. So it's kind of, all of that is is in the um, um, the chart your course interviewing chapter and, and helpful for 
all of us where wherever we are on our on our interviewing journey. You know, I can really relate with that um, question. <laughs> and, and and so so one of the things that I found was really helpful is really establishing relationships with hiring managers. Mm -hmm. So every institution I was at, we were so fortunate because we had hiring managers from every single field just about um, really partnered closely with us. And that really helped me because I learned a lot as a faculty member listening and doing mock interviews with these folks. And so, so it's okay not to be experts in every area. We just can't be, okay? And so, you know, we have, I have a laser focus on the things I do extremely well, okay? And then I rely on other professionals like Dorothy to kind of fill in the gaps for me, okay? And so, so that's, that's okay not to be an expert in that area. And then we actually got one more question today. Um, what is the difference between a qualifier and a differentiator? Um, I've heard both terms, but for the sake of clarifying it for my students, what are some of your thoughts behind those? Dave, I think I'm going to let you go first on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm so grateful for that question. And let me tell you why. Over my um, time in higher education over the past 30 years, I have seen so many students, okay, apply for positions and get rejected, okay? And it's not because they're not talented, okay? It's because they don't understand the difference between a qualifier and a differentiator. So qualifier is, is the basic requirements for a position. So an example would be education, okay? An example will be um, having um, a degree, okay? And so if you don't have the qualifiers, okay, it's going to be very difficult for you to get the opportunity, right? Now, differentiators are on top of qualifiers. And what I mean by that is differentiators are uniqueness to the individual. For example, foreign language being an example. The ability to speak Japanese is a differentiator for me. You know, I get hired, you know, by Japanese companies because I can speak Japanese, Okay, another example of a differentiator is, is, is certifications. For example, if you're applying for a technology position and you have Microsoft certification, that's a differentiator. So if career strategy faculty members can really teach the difference between those two, it's going to really alleviate, okay, a lot of tension for students. Because I can't tell you the number of students I've had in my career come to my office and say, you know, I've applied for 50 positions, Professor Harris. Okay, and I keep getting rejected. And then we get into the conversation, okay, um, about qualifiers and differentiators. And when they learn that, oh, that makes sense now. I now know why I'm not competitive for the opportunity. I don't even have the qualifiers. I'd rather have them learn that in college than upon graduation. And this just reminds me of something you said earlier, um, Dorothy, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here okay. for a second. Internships, okay? When you mention internships, Dorothy, it's really important. I wanna also say that internships are very important because I had an accounting student come to my office as an example. And she said, Professor Harris, I'm so glad I did an accounting internship. It's not for me. And she became a branding and marketing executive, okay? So, you know, internships are not only for getting a position, I just wanna add that, Dorothy, but. But the terms are really important, folks. So if you can teach students to learn the difference and then apply it to their job search, it's going to really help them. And also, you could almost teach a whole class on creating an ATS applicant tracking system resume. And that is what it does. So if those qualifiers are not met, you're out right away. It doesn't go any further than that. So it's interesting. The, the statistics are that most people, uh, over 80%, probably even higher, get your job through your network. Yet, so that 20%, that perhaps goes through the ATS systems and the online applications. So we always recommend the active strategies, the networking active strategies are, are, are much higher than the applying online because 
uh, actually applying for 50 jobs and not even getting an interview is not a normal. I mean, it can take uh, 200 to applying for 200 uh, jobs to maybe only get one or two interviews. It could take, you know, the, the numbers are really large for, for that, but that matching that um, applicant tracking system and and it's it's very picky on even font size and bolding and it's there's a whole art to that. So um, if you if I if I were to write a the third edition of chart your course, which I haven't decided, um, but there would be a, a whole new section on creating an applicant tracking system. It's just that that needs to be updated all the time. Um, that it it matters, makes a difference. Absolutely. Well, do we have any other questions today? I think that does it. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. It's been a wonderful discussion. We've really appreciated having you here. Um, just as a reminder, uh, this entire presentation has been recorded, and you'll receive access to that in the coming days. We'll also be providing the contact information for Dorothy and David so that if you have questions, you can reach out to them directly. Um, thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you again, Dorothy and Dave, for being with us and just for all of your wonderful information and for presenting with us today. It was really a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Megan, for your efforts as well. Um, Kendall Hunt is incredible. We really appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity. And Dorothy, thank you. Oh, Dave, thank you. And um, always, always a pleasure. As I said, our journey continues together. That's what networking and building relationships is about. And Thank you so much, Megan and Kendall Hunt, for your professionalism and uh, support. It's uh, it's very much valued. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs> well, thanks again, everyone, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye. Great.